What's up, everybody? Welcome to Party on Broad. It's your boy, Dives, Mr. Crockpot on Twitter. The Party on Broad podcast can be found on iTunes and Spotify. Smash that subscribe button, guys, if you guys are watching us here on the Painted Lions YouTube channel. Joining me today is, of course, my co-host. He is JR. Follow him on Twitter at JohnRussell215. What's up, JR? What up, buddy? I'm excited to be here. Excited to talk to the Cowboys stuff because I hate the Cowboys, even though... My older brother slash cousin loves the Cowboys. It's a great debate I have with him all the time. So this is very exciting. Yeah, man. The NFC East preview train keeps rolling. We did a Giants one with Patricia Trina. We did a Washington Redskins one with my man Mitch um, Tischler. And today we have John Williams from InsideTheStar.com joining us today. We're talking about expectations for the Dallas Cowboys, their top storylines heading into 2020. And we're going to kind of talk about how they project and match up with our Philadelphia Eagles. But first up, we have a little bit of news today. It is my man, JP. That is Jason Peters re-signing with the Philadelphia Eagles on a one-year deal. What was your quick reaction to that, man? I think we called it. I and mean, we said this about two weeks ago and then a week ago when, when the injury happened to um, to our offensive line. We, we kind of saw this happening. It's interesting that he'll be playing right guard. That's, yes. It's pretty cool that Lane Johnson will be able to look over him and um, help him out if he needs any help on that right side because he's so used to the left side. So it should be interesting, but it kind of in the back of your head just makes it feel a little bit better. Yeah. And you look at all the youth that needs to step up on the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm talking Andre Dillard. I'm talking even Derek Barnett needs to be in that list. Um, a wide receiver. But, you know, suddenly with that Brandon Brooks injury at right guard, that hole – I was a little nervous about because of Jack Driscoll, because of everything uncertain about that um, and the uncertainty with a shortened offseason. Immediately, you can plug in Jason Peters in at right guard. And I love how they came out and announced that he is going to be at right guard. Because for me, confidence-wise, Andre Dillard at left tackle, that is the number one storyline of this offseason for the Philadelphia Eagles. That Jeff Stoutland, Andre Dillard relationship is everything for 2020. And I love that it gave me a little bit of confidence of this guy, of Andre Dillard. I think he's coming in at like reports say 335 pounds or something like that. This is a big dude. Um, I just don't know if this guy is physically and mentally ready uh, to be Carson Wentz's blind side. Um, I, what is your take on Andre Dillard right now? Well, you know, they got to be keeping tracks of these players. And Stadlin has to know something. If right off the bat they came out and said, yo, we're signing Peters, but he's going to be a guard. And not only is he going to be guard, he's going to be on the right side. So, Dillard, the left side is yours to protect Carson. So, all indications say that we're moving in the right direction. So, I'm I'm happy. I'm, let's be hands off. Let's not get too analytical. Let's not get too crazy. Let's just be happy that the bodyguard is back and uh, we got our Peters back. I'm very happy about that. Yeah, dude, and I, I just cannot uh, let go that so much uncertainty is happening with the NFL this season, with the shortened off season, and you know we know one thing's for certain: JP, this guy knows how to change positions. Uh, Two, that right side of the offensive line is healed; it is back uh, between Kelsey Peters and Lane Johnson. That is one less thing the Eagles need to worry about. I don't know about the left side, <laughs> Sam Malu, Andre Dillard, that's a major question mark. But at least that's one part for Carson Wentz to stay comfortable in the pocket. Because when that guy is in rhythm, that guy is a beast. And well, let's – go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you could say the left side is just youth. I mean, the right side is going to be experience and age. The left side is going to be youth. And they shouldn't have to come off the field. Like, we're not going to be rotating people in on the left side. You guys are too young. You're too talented. You're going to be too fast. Let's just see what happens. It's not the worst thing. No. And you you know what you're getting with Jason Peters. You know, was he a little overrated in 2019? Yes. He struggled with penalties. We all know that. Um, but at least you can throw Miles Sanders on the left. You can throw a tight end on the left. You can uh, add a little bit of protection for Carson Wentz on the left. But that's about Jason Peters. Happy to have him back. Uh, but today, it is Tuesday. 
It is the, you know, there's a lot going on with the Dallas Cowboys and Dak Prescott. And I'd love to hear your quick thoughts on this. You know, no one can deny that the touchdowns and yards are there for Mr. Dak Prescott. That part is fine. But when you kind of dig a little deeper uh, with Dak Prescott, uh, you know, Dak Prescott, there's only over the last two seasons, no one has had more turnovers than touchdowns versus playoff teams. Mitch Trubisky, Jameis Winston, Baker Mayfield, Dak Prescott. He is in that group of guys uh, over the last two seasons that had more turnovers than touchdowns. So the deadline to reach a long-term deal is tomorrow. Uh, what's your take on Dak Prescott? Well, we're kind of in a win-win, aren't we? Like, if they don't sign Dak, then that's great because he's a very valuable quarterback. I mean, like we'll talk about soon on. Like, we do a lot of matting ratings and matting ratings, and Carson and Dak are the same same rating. So if they don't sign him, cool, because you're not going to have that guy at quarterback. But if you do sign him, you're going to kind of handcuff your team for the next six to seven years. So I think as Eagles fans, we're kind of in a win-win, especially after this Mahomes signing. Like, Dak's going to get some money if they re-sign him. And we let you sit back and, hey, either you do or you don't. Either way, we kind of win in the division. Love it. So uh, we are going to roll the interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. Again, make sure to hit that subscribe button here at the Painted Lions YouTube channel. Uh, for JR, for myself, enjoy the interview. Thanks for watching. All right, guys, please give a warm welcome to our guest. He is a Dallas Cowboys staff writer for InsideTheCowboys.com. Check them out at InsideTheStarDC. But most importantly, give a follow, my man, uh, at John9Williams on Twitter. Welcome to the show, John. How you doing, dude? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, y'all. I'm really excited to, to talk Cowboys, especially in Philadelphia Eagles territory, where maybe we can clarify a few things and maybe, you know, uh, bring some knowledge to some of the narratives that might be out there. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the website, dude. So, yeah. So I write actually for inside the star.com. Um, been, you know, started off there as just kind of a contributor back in 2016. Uh, when my daughter was born, I just kind of needed a little bit of a hobby. I was staying at home a little bit more. And so I first started off just writing fantasy football articles for inside the star. And then uh, in 2017 transitioned to focusing more just on the, the on-field product for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and so, yeah, just started off as a kind of a no-name guy and got a lot of help from a lot of people. Uh, our, our managing editor, Bryson Treese, was, was huge in helping me develop my writing, um, helping me to find a, a clearer uh, voice and, and better grammar, especially. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a painstaking process for him, but, you know, hopefully it's paying off for him now. You know, and then... Um, you know, about a year ago, I started uh, a podcast inside the Cowboys that's, you know, it's grown a little bit. It's there's a lot of Cowboys podcasts, um, but it's been something that's really been fun for me. I've gotten to actually interview uh, some people that I've grown up listening to on the radio. Uh, Bob Sturm in Dallas, Fort Worth. He's been uh, a Dallas radio guy since the early or late 90s. And he's somebody I listen to on my commutes to college and um and so that's that was that was a huge deal for me to to be able to do at the end of the or beginning of the year um uh, to be able to interview him and have him on the show so yeah it's 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 really a lot of fun you know talking sports is something that i've always enjoyed doing uh growing up as a kid with my dad you know we'd always just talk whatever whatever was in season we'd talk about it we'd play it um and and as an adult now it's just a fun kind of hobby and uh it, it's neat to see that people actually care that I have what I have to say. And, um, and, you know, it, it's kind of wild to think that, you know, four, four years ago, five years ago, I had very few followers. I had very few people that who knew, knew who I was. Um, but now people actually reach out to me for, for questions, which is, it's really humbling. It's weird, you know, amidst all the different people that people could go to for Cowboys insight to have people actually care what I have to say is, is pretty humbling. So. Well, thank you so much for joining. Today we are talking about uh, the Dallas Cowboys. We're going to talk about you know the top headlines and storylines you know heading into the 2020 regular season. So, John, uh, let's start off with the questions. Uh, the biggest question right now has to be centered around Dak Prescott. I guess the two aren't close in negotiations right now. Uh, the contract extension deadline is like literally tomorrow. Uh, a lot of arguments seems to be kind of centered around that third and fourth year of the deal. Um, so you wrote an awesome article at uh, InsideTheStar.com on the Dak Prescott contract situation. Go check that out. 
uh, guys at InsideTheStar.com. But uh, where do you stand on the Cowboys giving Dak Prescott that contract extension? And like, what is your confidence level that the Cowboys uh, will eventually get it done? Yeah, in a kind of in a non COVID-19 year, I feel like I'd be at 100 percent. that This contract would get done tomorrow. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys like to draw out these franchise tag negotiations, especially. I mean, Des Bryant back in 2015 was on the franchise tag. Dallas Cowboys got him done on tag deadline day. Uh, Demarcus Lawrence, he got franchise tagged for a year, played on it. He got franchise tagged a second time. And, and they actually drug him out until early April, which was going to be about the time that he needed to have surgery to have enough time to rehab to be ready for week one of the, of the 2019 season. And they made it happen. They got it done. Uh, I still feel pretty confident that they're going to get this deal done tomorrow. You know, there there have been you know some reports that say that you know the Dallas Cowboys and Dak haven't been talking. There have been reports that say they had they have been talking. And so it's just you know nobody's going to really know until it's actually done. Um, you know, I, I think you know we're in that season of misinformation, just like before the NFL draft. Kind of what you hear, you have to filter out, and you have to look at who's saying it to to know uh, what's what's happening. But you know, this is a contract that's a no-brainer for me. Um, you know, we people are going to argue over a couple million dollars here and there. Um, they're going to argue over years and how long it should be. Uh, but you know, really, what it is is Dak Prescott's a franchise quarterback. He's one of the better five to ten quarterbacks in the NFL. He's proven that over his over the course of his four years. Why it's a debate, I'm not exactly sure. If you look back at the Dallas Cowboys history and you look at that period between 2000 and 2006. Uh, post Troy Aikman, pre Tony Romo, where they're running out Chad Hutchinson and Drew Henson and Quincy Carter and Vinny Testaverde and uh, Drew Bledsoe at the end of his career and a bunch of other guys that were backup quarterbacks or worse in the NFL. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense that this is a, a contract that you wouldn't do because you know you you really lucked into two franchise quarterbacks in a row. You had. You know, you got Tony Romo. He was an undrafted free agent. He was your franchise starter for 10 years until he got hurt. And then Dak Prescott steps in as a fourth round rookie. People didn't believe he had the, the skills as a passer that would allow him to be an NFL quarterback, but he developed those pretty quickly over the offseason. Now he definitely had a good circumstance to step into with a really nice offensive line, really good running game and a good you know wide receiver and Des Bryant before injuries really you know, kind of took the, took the toll on him. But you know that that first season, the Dallas Cowboys went thirteen and three with Dak Prescott at the, as a starting quarterback, and we're just a couple plays away from pulling off a number against the Packers in the divisional round of that of that playoff. Uh, and yes, there have been ups and downs. I think there are with every quarterback, uh, especially earlier in their in their career. But I think overall, what we've seen from Dak Prescott is that he's a long term starter in the NFL. Uh, you know. The second half of 2018, where the Dallas Cowboys went seven and one to finish the season, I mean that was a great run of quarterback play by Dak Prescott. After the Dallas Cowboys traded for Amari Cooper, he finally had a receiver that could separate a little bit. Which you know that's kind of Dak's mo. He likes to throw guys, throw to guys that get open. And you know Des Bryant, great receiver in his in his time, but he was more of the athletic jump ball, go get it kind of a player. Uh, Dak likes to just. You know, if you get open, I'm going to get you the ball. He's he's kind of the point guard back there. He's going to spread the ball around a little bit. Um, and so I think even last year, you know, we saw a progression in Dak Prescott's game. In 2018, he was one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the NFL. 2019, he was one of the least sacked quarterbacks in the NFL. And some of that is offensive line play, but a lot of that's on the quarterback as well. The quarterback has to be assertive, decisive, and he has to get rid of the ball. He has to be comfortable in the pocket and confident in his movement in the pocket. And he just was a, a different quarterback in that right. And a lot of that credit goes to Dak Prescott and to his quarterback coach last year, John Kitna. Uh, and then the other thing I think um, that really opened his game up was Kellen Moore. Kellen Moore, he wants to you know assert a vertical-based passing offense. And the Dallas Cowboys did that. They had three wide receivers, averaged more than 15 yards per reception last season. And so you know Dak Prescott took another step. And he seems to do that every single year where – you know, if there's something that he didn't do well that season, he's going to go in, into the offseason. He's going to work on that and he's going to improve his game. And so to me, it's a no brainer. Uh, you know, where the money ends up landing is going to be where the money lands. It's not going to be a hindrance to the Dallas Cowboys on future salary caps, whatever the money is. I mean, they can they can make the money work for them. They can make the contract work for them in future years through restructuring, through, um, you know, restructuring other players 
on, on contracts. And so I don't think that Cowboys fans should worry about whether or not Dow, Dak Prescott is going to get a top one or two uh, quarterback contract. Obviously, he's not going to get a Patrick Mahomes contract. That just blew everything out of the water. <laughs> um, but I, I feel fairly comfortable saying that he's going to end up yeah. around Russell Wilson to, you know, and maybe a little bit more. We in Philly have, like, I mean, obviously, we're going to be a debate. Even in Madden, they're the same NFL rating this year <laughs> yeah. in the new Madden. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to say take bias out of it. So I'm just going to ask you how much better do you think Dak is than Carson? I mean, I don't think he's that much better. I think they're in that similar tier of quarterback play. But you, know? you think he's better. I but do you think he's better. I mean, I'm going to take my guy. You know, I think if the if if it was reversed and Carson Wentz was on my team, I might take him. You know, it's you know, there's a lot of things that 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things Carson Wentz does really well that Dak Prescott doesn't do. There's things that Dak does better than Carson Wentz. I think Benjamin Solak from uh, Bleeding Green Nation had a really really good article about this that just broke it all down. And at the end of it, I was like. Yeah, he's pretty much right. I mean, it's it's pick your poison kind of a thing. They're both good quarterbacks. I think they're both in that same five to ten um, range of NFL quarterbacks right now. Uh, I think both have opportunities for growth. I think both have things that they can do better. Um, I think Carton, Carson Wentz showed a lot of um, a lot of guts last year. I think he he showed something last year uh, and and kind of overcame some obstacles last year that that really helped further solidify him as a franchise quarterback. Um, and I don't think there's ever been any doubt that he's a good quarterback that has the potential for greatness as well. It's similar to Dak. I think, you know, he's a good quarterback that has the potential for greatness. You know, if there's a, if there's one thing that I would point to between the two that I prefer, especially with Dak Prescott is the durability. Yep. Um, you know, as good as Carson Wentz is, that's a concern. You know, there's, you know, he two regular seasons that he wasn't able to finish. He wasn't able to finish the playoff game last year. Um, and for better or for worse, that's, that's a concern and it's something that has to be watched, but he's a good quarterback. I, you know, I, you know, we get into these debates and we, we talk about it on Twitter a lot. And some of the things that I might say are just kind of for joke or for funny, and especially the running gag that we've got over there about Jalen hurts being the, this new starting quarterback or whatever. That's all just kind of for fun and games. I mean, I don't, you know, we know Carson Wentz is the starter and we know, you know, I believe he's a good quarterback, you know, and I'm not just saying that cause I'm on a Philly a Philly podcast. <laughs> you know, I think I've been saying it for a few weeks now, you know, Carson Wentz is also a good quarterback. Yeah. I think we can both all agree that, you know, Carson yeah. Wentz and deck Prescott have to show us that they can win the big game. And that's, that's yeah. something both have really struggled with uh, in addition to the injury history for Carson Wentz. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Mike McCarthy. The Cowboys clearly saw McCarthy's history with developing Aaron Rodgers in green Bay and how that could help Dak Prescott, Prescott take that next step in his development. Uh, what are your early impressions of Mark, Mike McCarthy, and what kind of impact do you see that guy making as a first-year Cowboys head coach? Well, I think we're going to see something that's completely night and day from Jason Garrett. I mean, Jason Garrett, he was a conservative, run first, control the clock um, head coach. I mean, I think he was a good head coach. It just didn't work out in Dallas for them to get over the top. Um but Mike McCarthy, he comes in with a boatload of experience and, and um, accomplishments. I mean, he's been to four NFC championship games, been to a Super Bowl and won it. Uh, I don't blame everything that went down in Green Bay completely on Mike McCarthy. I think most people know what kind of guy Aaron Rodgers is. Um, I'm not breaking any news there. And so it's not surprising to see that there were some clashes there and you know, if you're a franchise, you're going to go with your franchise quarterback over your head coach more often than not, because it's easier to replace the head coach than the franchise quarterback. Um, and so I, I, I'm really excited for, for the move because we're getting for the biggest reason I think I'm, I'm excited about it is that it's going to decrease some of the um, dissidents, I guess you could say, between Jason Garrett and Kellen Moore. Well, where Jason Garrett wants to control the ball, you know, throw safe passes to the boundaries on those on those curls and um comeback routes Kellen Moore wants to get the ball down the field he wants to push it uh, and he wants to run verticals you know he, he talked about it in the John Gruden uh quarterback camp back when he was in the coming out of the draft and he's like four verts four verts four verts that's what I want to do and we saw it last year they ran a lot of four verts and um and we're going to see that again this year I think but what what a, what Mike McCarthy allows is 
a similar aggression level. You know, Mike McCarthy is an aggressive head coach. You know, uh, Bob, Bob Sturm uh, of the ticket and the athletic, he wrote a great piece back when he was hired uh, that broke down that Mike McCarthy was one of the, uh, you know, he went for it on fourth down more than just about anybody in the NFL over the last five years before he had gotten fired. Jason Garrett was one that had gone for it the least amount of times on fourth down. You know, challenges, Mike McCarthy's going to challenge plays like crazy. Jason Garrett rarely challenged plays. Uh, Mike McCarthy, you know, he's going to allow, you know, the Dallas Cowboys to open up their offense a little bit more, whereas at times early in the season against some tougher competition maybe, you know, Jason Garrett maybe didn't allow that. He wanted to, you know, play it safe on the road, play it safe against teams like the Patriots or the Saints. Um or Mike McCarthy, he's. I think he's going to be a guy that's like, no, we're going for the jugular. We're we're going to s- establish our dominance, and and they've got the offense to do it. You know, their their offense from the offensive line to the wide receivers to the running back and the quarterback. I mean, there's no reason they shouldn't be a thirty to thirty five point per game offense this year. Some interesting parallels there with the Eagles and Cowboys. Right, so uh, the Eagles want to open up their offense a little bit and. Uh, they got definitely predictable on offense last year. So there's some really – they brought in Marty Morganweg, you know, studying some Lamar Jackson tape to how to implement Jalen Hurts in that offense. So, you know, definitely re, you know, re-implement that vertical game. Go ahead, JR. You segue right into Ezekiel Elliott and the running game with Mike McCarthy in this new offense. You're going to be running a lot of four verts. What do we see McCarthy's, like, game plan with Zeke going forward? Because he really wasn't the Zeke of two, three years ago. Are the treads coming off the tires a little bit? I think some of what happened with Zeke last year is missing training camp. I mean, as much as he said he was staying in shape for the regular season, not getting into camp and not working out like they do in training camps, I think it's it had to have an effect. And while he, he actually had a few hundred-yard games at the beginning of the season, he wasn't breaking the long runs like he usually does more towards the end of the season. He was much more explosive in the second half of the season than he was the first. Uh, I don't I don't worry too much about Ezekiel Elliott. I think he's going to still be, you know, in, in the top five at the end of the year in, in uh, carries and in yardage. I think the thing that we're going to see that's going to be a little bit different from Ezekiel Elliott is maybe a higher efficiency rate. Uh, you know, I think the with the draft pick of C.D. Lamb in the first round uh, this year, we're going to see a lot more eleven personnel out of the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, you're not going to want to take any of those three guys off the field to put Dalton Schultz or Blake Bell on the field or Jameez Olawale. You know. No disrespect to those guys, but your best offense that you need to be in 75 to 80 percent of the time is 11 personnel. Your three wide offense. Um, Ze- Ezekiel Elliott has a high, you know, a five and a half yard per carry, a pretty high success rate running out of 11 personnel. He did that a lot at a, at Ohio State, and so I think we're going to see a higher efficiency out of Ezekiel Elliott, even if we don't see as many carries. I mean, he may not hit 300 carries this year because we know Mike McCarthy. He likes to throw the ball. Uh, Kellen Moore, he wants to throw the ball. So even if they, the run pass ratio uh, skews more to the pass this year, I think we still might see, uh, you know, similar yardage totals from Ezekiel Elliott, just more efficiency out of him. Awesome. Um, staying, you know, on that CD Lamb train, a key area for the Cowboys in 2020 has to be the start fast out the gate. The Cowboys trailed at halftime in eight games last year, lost all those eight games. So enter C.D. Lamb, the 17th pick in the draft, electric wide receiver for the Cowboys. What are your expectations for C.D. Lamb, and how do you expect him to impact the offense? Now let me just preface this by saying I'm also an Oklahoma Sooner fan. So <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I was literally ecstatic. Like I was shaking when I'm they got, went on the clock at 17. <laughs> and they had, you know, and he's sitting there. Um, I was actually at work that night and I'm watching the draft play out and I'm like, okay, he's still there at 13. Yeah. He's still there at 15. Wait, the Falcons took a cornerback. He's on the clock. We all are they going <laughs> are they going to mess this up? And I was super nervous about it. I, I, I've never been nervous for a draft pick, but I was really nervous about this because I just didn't think it was possible. And so I've got very high expectations for him because I've watched him for three years at OU. I mean, when he came in as a freshman, he was, you know, on the field, he was making plays, you know, as a sophomore to me, if he could have come out in the 2018 NFL or sorry, the 2019 NFL draft, the year that Marquise Brown went in the first round to the Ravens, CD lamb would have been a higher draft pick in my opinion, because he's a more complete wide receiver. I think he's a more pro ready wide receiver than Marquise Brown was. And we saw how effective he was last year. You know, CD lamb can run a full route tree. 
He's a guy that plays physical. He plays with an edge. You know, they gave him that 88 a la Des Bryant, Michael Irvin. Mm-hmm. He's got a similar edge to his game that those guys played with. Uh, he's vocal. He's going to be a leader on the field. Whereas Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, they, they're a little more quiet. They, they kind of lead by example. CeeDee Lamb, he's he's got that fiery personality. At times, you might even say he's a diva. Um, but I mean, I've got high expectations. I, you know, what the option numbers look like and the yardage numbers look like, that's going to be, you know, up in the air, but there's a lot of opportunity because Randall Cobb, Jason Witten are gone. Those two guys accounted for more than 160 targets last year. Uh, enter Blake Jarwin as the starting tight end and CD lamb is the starting slot receiver. And I think there's a huge opportunity for him to have an excellent first year because defenses are still going to have to worry about Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup on the outside who both went over 1100 yards, both averaged more than 15 yards per reception and are established veterans in the NFL. And so that's going to create a lot of favorable coverages for CD lamb and on the inside, when they want to flex him to out wide and bring Amari Cooper into the slot, he's going to see favorable coverages on the outside as well. Uh, I think Kellen Moore will look for ways to get the ball in his hand in the short area of the field so that he can you know, run with the ball after catch because I don't know if you watched the, the Texas game from last year, but he made those guys look like they were high schoolers. I mean, just running through guys like crazy. Uh, and the other thing that he brings to the game that I don't think enough people talk about is the way he blocks. And he is a dynamic blocker in the run game. Like he takes pride in it and not just like wide receivers say, I take pride in it. Like he's really good at it. And so as a slot receiver, he's almost like a big, you know, like a a small tight end or like, I like to call him a light end. Mm. Um, You know, he's, he's a good blocker. I mean, he's not obviously. He he's have he's six two, one ninety five. Let's not call him a small tight end. All right. He's not. I mean. He blocks as well as any slot receiver that you might see on the field. I um, agree. They dude's got some good blocking. I've watched and so, this film. And so you're gonna you can even use him as a crack blocker. You know, to to chip a defensive end and let Zeke and Tony Pollard get to the outside. So I'm very excited for it. I think Dak Prescott's gonna love this guy. He's got a huge catcher radius. Uh, you know drops which were an issue for the Dallas Cowboys last year Dak Prescott's targets led the league in drop passes uh that's not going to be an issue with CD Lamb he's going to catch the ball all right I, look I'm 6'2 195 I'm not cracking a D end in the NFL <laughs> ever okay they're going to throw me on my ass and I know CD Lamb's well, about the same size and weight so I'm not, say, saying, oh, I'm not saying panic. I'm just saying he's going to be able to get the guy and move him out of the way <laughs> Clowny's going to be like, yo, get away from me, dude. Yeah, Just yeah. get away from me. Now that's All a different right, so, kind of defensive end. <laughs> fair point. Yeah. But the Cowboys, let's talk about the Cowboys defense because yeah. last year you guys kind of struggled, especially um, with the turnover ratio, especially in the defensive backfield. You really weren't bringing the interceptions. Yeah. Um, what's this new defensive coordinator, Mike Nolan, going to do? I mean, what's his reputation looking like? And how is Cowboys Nation, are they really bringing him in and excited? Because you guys kind of have an overturn in the defensive area. Yeah, there was huge turnover all over the coaching staff. Uh, as, you know, the defense is pretty much completely new. Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement for Mike Nolan. You know, it's going to be a, a different philosophy, similar to the move from Mike McCarthy or Jason Garrett to Mike McCarthy. I think the move from Rod Marinelli and Chris Richard to Mike Nolan is a welcomed change. You know, the the Rod Marinelli and Mike uh, Chris Richard uh, philosophy to defense was we're going to rush four guys. Uh, every once in a while, we'll send f- a fifth. Uh, and we're going to play coverage. Um, the passivity that came with that uh, didn't really lead to turnovers. Some of the way that they schemed their cornerbacks didn't really uh, promote the opportunity for ton- turnovers. Well, Mike Nolan's coming in. We're saying, no, we're going to rush five, and we're going to rush six, and we're going to rush it a lot. Uh, in his history, he's he's been one of the – you know his teams have had one of the higher blitz rates in the NFL. Uh, the Saints last year, though, I'm, he wasn't the defensive coordinator. He was just a linebacker's coach. They blitz more than 40% of the time uh, back in his days with Atlanta and San Francisco, they had high blitz rates. And so they're going to, they're going to bring, they're going to bring rushers. And Mike McCarthy even said in his opening press conference that he wants to have a designated fifth rusher and they want to bring the blitz. They want to, they want to make quarterbacks uncomfortable. And I think that's going to be a welcome change because a lot of times I think we got frustrated just watching that. Okay, here we go. Four rushers again, doing the same thing that we do every time. You know, occasionally we'll we'll run a stunt, a, a DN stunt, and um, you know, and and it would work. And you know, Demarcus Lawrence was great at times, but I think he's going to benefit the most out of this because you know, as teams are having to account for the blitz, 
he's going to get more one-on-one -on -one opportunities than he might have in previous years. So there, I think there's a lot of excitement. I think it's going to bode well for the Dallas Cowboys. There's been a lot of turnover um, in the coaching staff. They've done a lot to bring in you know, a handful of different cornerbacks. I think they've signed, they signed three cornerbacks. They drafted two. Uh, and they re-signed one of their own that went to free agency, all with the idea that they want to bring in big press man corners that are going to attack the ball and attempt to force takeaways. All right. Just to kind of like piggyback off the last segment, you know, I, I can't get over the CD Lamb pick because I don't, I, I'm sure you guys are fully aware of how much we love – Eagles fans love CD Lamb. And watching him yeah. fall – I'm sure all Cowboys fans are just, you know, in pure bliss, just knowing that you took our guy. I'm a big Jalen Rieger fan. Um, yeah. I love that. He's a good one. I think he's going to be great. Um, but, man, let's talk about um, some other rookies because I loved your draft. I hated the Eagles draft. Uh, Jay and I differ in that. Um, but, you know, Trevon Diggs, Reggie Robinson II, uh, those are two playmaking defensive backs, uh, really solid picks. So, uh, talking about a shortened offseason, you know, posing a major threat for young guys. I know the Cowboys really need some of these young guys to step up. How does a shortened offseason impact the Dallas Cowboys? Yeah, you know, I've been I kind of been talking about this a lot over at inside the star .com. Um, I really think it impacts a lot of the typical training camp battles, whereas in more in typical seasons, some of these rookies might actually be able to compete uh, for a job. You know, a Trayvon Diggs. You know, yes, he'll be in competition with somebody like maybe Daryl Worley, uh, who the Dallas Cowboys signed away from the Oakland Raiders, former Philadelphia Eagle, at least for a short time. <laughs> yeah, very short. But yeah, good. very short. I mean, yeah, barely and barely Eagle. Um, you know, I think the rookies are, are kind of starting off with, you know, behind behind the eight ball a little bit. Uh, the veterans that they're going to competing with are going to have an edge just because they they know what an NFL training camp looks like. They know what the expectations are. Uh, they they know a lot of the offense if they're coming back from last year. So somebody like Joe Looney, who started 18 games for the Dallas Cowboys in 2016, including the playoffs, you know he's going to have a leg up on Wisconsin center Tyler Biadish, uh, who comes in with a lot of you know with a high a good reputation. He was the Remington Award winner as the set, college's best center. But again, you know you have a veteran who's played in the NFL, who's played well. Ezekiel Elliott led the league in rushing the year that Joe Looney was the starter at center. Uh, playing against a guy who's coming off of a shoulder injury that he had to have surgically repaired um, and coming into the NFL with no rookie mini camp, no OTAs, no mini camps, and then going to have to hit the ground running in training camp. Yes, they had the virtual stuff, but you know, those mental reps are good, but they don't replace the, the full on practice reps. And so I, I think the rookies are, are going to, you know, maybe struggle a little, little bit. And I think that's why the Dallas Cowboys really did their best to try and, you know, establish some depth at those positions where they would have, you know, rookies or younger guys challenging for positions, especially like at cornerback. Yes. I mean, Trayvon Diggs, Reggie Robinson are, are excellent. And they, I think both of them have a chance to be starters for the Dallas Cowboys in the future, but they also hedged a little by bringing in somebody like Daryl Worley, uh, a Maurice Canada who played with the Baltimore Ravens, and the New York jets. Um, and so, yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of agree that, you know, these rookies, they're going to really have to prove that they are above and beyond better than their veteran counterpart whenever training camp kicks off. John, do you think that these D-backs that you brought in as rookies more or less fit an early 2000s type role as far as D-backs go, where you have more length and body and you want to be physical up top the line of scrimmage? And maybe in today's NFL, that doesn't really transi transition it, like what's going on. I mean, as an Eagles fan, I know we have a lot of sprinters on our team. Yeah. Yeah. that are just speedster guys and all it takes is getting off the line of scrimmage to just get past big body corners you guys kind of stocked up on big dudes now this is my next question it's just something i've been thinking about with the cowboys because i go back and forth with my cousin it's not like you're really molding in the new nfl you're kind of sticking to your plan and we're gonna have big tall physical d-backs and see what happens yeah it's going to be interesting to see that's been one of the kind of the concerns that's been kicked around at times is because like you said, a lot of the NFL is going to speed, going to getting open, quicker guys, you know, shorter area, or sh guys that can win in the short areas of the field, um, guys that can get off the line of scrimmage. And yeah, so somebody like Jalen Rager, he's going to be a concern. Um, how they how they play that is going to be interesting. I think we'll see more cover two from the Dallas Cowboys uh, under Mike Nolan than we might have 
under Chris Richard, who was strictly a cover three defensive coordinator, Rod Marinelli, pretty much a cover three guy. Um, I think with like Xavier Woods and Ha Ha Clinton Dix, we'll see more cover two out of those guys uh, on the back end to help maybe cover up for some of those that speed deficiency that that we might have. I mean, these guys are also pretty quick; they're they're fast, uh, but they're definitely not as fast as some of the wide receivers that are gonna, that they're going to be having to guard. Uh, I think the hope is that they play a lot of press man, that they disrupt anything that any of the timing, and they're not they're not letting these guys off the line of scrimmage. Now, of course. You know, with the way that the Dallas Cowboys want to play defense moving forward, they're going to get burned more than they did under Rod Marinelli and Chris Richard. That's just going to be the, the nature of the beast because they're going to be more aggressive sending blitzers. They're going to be more aggressive at the line of scrimmage, which means there's going to be times where, you know, a, a receiver gets behind a guy and there's going to be a blown coverage and that guy's just going to be off to the races. So what what does Dallas Nation constitute as a successful season this year? Is 9-10 wins like a good season, or do you have to go deep into the playoffs for you guys to say this is a good year? Man, that that's a tough one. You know, I think for me personally, I always try to approach it with this idea that getting in the playoffs is the first goal because it takes a lot of luck in the, in the playoffs or a lot of fortune, I guess we could say, uh, in the playoffs – to be able to advance deep into the playoffs. I mean, if you look back to the 2014 game where the Dallas Cowboys were playing the Green Bay Packers, have has if DeMarco Murray doesn't fumble the ball late in the game, you know, the Dallas Cowboys were just driving down the field. If if the Des Bryant catch goes a little bit differently, we won't debate whether he caught it or not. Um, you know, that changes the outcome of that game as well. Uh, you know, you look at the 2016 game when the you know Dak Prescott had brought him back had led them back to tie the game late in the fourth quarter. Aaron Rodgers, you know, is getting pressured up the middle. They don't call a holding call on David or anything for whatever reason. Uh, and then he makes this incredible, like off balance throw just over Byron Jones. Jared Cook makes this incredible basket catch just along the sideline and stays in bounds. And you're like, and then Mason, Cro Mason Crosby of all people hits a 51 yarder to win the game. You're like, what, what else can you do? Like, what else can you do except for not get off to such a slow start? Um, you know, it takes some fortunate bounces to go your way or, or, you know, some some things that have to go your way to advance deep into the playoffs. I mean, Philadelphia Eagles are a perfect example, I feel like. Had Nick Foles not been as good as he was during your Super Bowl run, you know, that, that goes differently. You know, Carson Wentz gets injured. I mean, I don't know many people that thought when Carson Wentz got injured that, yeah, we're we're still Super Bowl contenders. Um, but then you went on and won the, won the, won the Super Bowl. And so it, you got to have a little bit of lady, lady luck on your side uh, to make a deep run into the playoffs. So for me, I always just start with just get in the playoffs, whether it's, you know, hopefully it's win the division because that gives you a leg up on advancing. Uh, but just get in because the schedule is what it is. You know, there's so much parity in the NFL that week to week, you know, you hope that you're going to win every game, but that's just not the reality of the situation. I mean, there were several games last year that I thought, oh, they'll win this game, like the Jets. Um, and then we go up into New York and we, you know, lay an egg. You know, Amari Cooper's injured. We're, we're without our offensive tackles, and but we still can't pull it off. And um, and so there's going to be games like that every year, but you gotta got to win more than you lose. And and so, you know, all, you, all I feel like what is a reasonable expectation is get to the playoffs. Whatever happens after that, that's, you know, that's not in your control. All you can do is best you can, which, you know, that, and that's weird coming from a Cowboys fan, five, <laughs> five Super Bowls, but I'm kind of a, a late blooming Cowboys fan. Um, I didn't start following the team until like 2000. I have some, some other fandom history in my back pocket, but I actually didn't, I, I was a transplant Texan and, and was a Chiefs fan for a while and a Niners fan before that. And, um, because of Joe Montana, that was my guy. Okay. And then, uh, and then in 2000, just kind of bought into the Cowboys and then experienced six years of nothingness. <laughs> um, but yeah. And so like, I don't have these Super Bowl or bus expectations because I've never seen a Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what those nineties were like, you know, where you were the best team in football every year. And so I, you know, I am, I think getting to the playoffs, that's the first goal, you know, obviously you want to advance beyond that, but there's a lot of things that go on in, in a playoff game in NFL games that, that, that they have to go right for you to advance and, and win a Super Bowl. 
Awesome. So, you know, obviously the Eagles just re-signed uh, Jason Peters. He's back. He's going to play right guard. As the rosters currently stand, uh, how do you see the Dallas Cowboys matching up with the Philadelphia Eagles this season, man? Yeah, you know, it's 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 going to come down to those two teams in the division, right? Like we don't – I don't – like New York's better, but I don't think they're going to be down in the division. Washington is Washington. They, you know, I think Dwayne Haskins can be good, but I don't think they're ready yet. And so it's it's Cowboys Eagles, you know, and I I still think they match up really well. You know, we we split the last I think we split last year if I remember right. Uh, Y'all got the the one late in the season that really turned the tide in the division, um, and and it's going to come down to the uh, you know it could come down to those two games. Now obviously they play up you know fourteen other games that are going to make a big difference. But I really do think that the division will come down to those two games. And I, and again, it's close because again, like you said, Jason Peters just got brought back. The Eagles already had a good offensive line. Uh, they have one of the best defensive lines in football. Uh, Carson Wentz is a good quarterback. The wide receivers are really good. Zach Ertz, Dallas, Dallas Goddard are really good. Miles Sanders, I think is going to have a breakout year. Love him in fantasy football this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hate that because he's, I feel like he'll have some good games against the Cowboys. Um, you know, he's just, he's just a dynamic player. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's going to be, they're going to be close games like they usually are. Uh, they're going to be games that hinge on one or two plays like they usually are. Uh, and, but I think, again, I, I still think they match up well with each other, if that makes any sense. Ooh. You know, the Dallas Cowboys improved their defensive line. Uh, you know, they still have a good offensive line. You know, I, I don't, I don't know what, where the Eagles are with coverage. I know they signed Ronald Darby and that's going to be a huge help for them. Uh, but again, there's going to be a lot for the Eagles defensive backs to cover in the secondary. Uh, and so it's going to be, it, there be really interesting matchups like they are every year. Obviously I'm going to be biased and think the Dallas Cowboys can win. Uh, but you know, we haven't even started training camp yet. You know, there's no telling what the season's going to look like, especially with COVID-19. We could get to, you know, the first Eagles game and one of our starting quarterbacks could be in quarantine because of COVID-19 and, <laughs> It's either Andy Dalton and, or Jalen Hurts starting on the other side. So who knows what's going to happen? And will you be rooting for the Oklahoma Sooner to just take care of business? <laughs> I wanted to. I want him to have a good game, just not win. How about that? <laughs> you know, like it's it's kind of like I, whenever I because I play a lot of fantasy football, and so anytime that I have an opposing player, I'm like, I want them to have a good game, just not win. <laughs> like that's both both can both things can be true. I think I think the obvious one leg up that the Eagles have over the Cowboys right now, as we stand over the whole NFC East, is consistent coaching, um, especially yeah. in the shortened off season. That's where the Eagles might have an advantage. What about you, Jr.? Like, how do you see the Cowboys Eagles matchup right now? To be honest, I think we play the Cowboys three times next year. Uh, I think it's twice in the regular season and once in the playoffs. Uh, maybe by the time the playoffs start, we might have fans back in the stadiums who knows uh regular season i'll say split because it's just so easy and a coward way to say that when it comes to cowboys eagles it's just so uh, we'll win at home you win at home whatever yeah um we'll both beat up on the giants and the redskins because they're terrible yeah (laughs) but i I feel like sometimes the cowboys and the eagles are like that spider-man meme we're like the ones pointing at the other one and like we're like the same because i feel like our quarterback situation is so similar i feel like our running back is going to be on the level Zeke will be maybe not this year, maybe a year from now. We both have great lines. Our secondaries are kind of iffy. We'll see what yeah. happens. And then I, it says like what you said, Chris. It comes down to coaching, and I love Doug. Doug got me a Super Bowl, so I'll give a slight advantage to the birds. Awesome. So that is John Williams. Uh, make sure you give him a follow at John Nine Williams. He is part of Inside the Star DC on Twitter. Thanks for joining, John. Hey, man, thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys. Look forward to uh, talking more maybe in the regular season. Yeah, and, uh, let's do it. Be- go Cowboys. Thanks, man. Have a good night, dude. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night. Westbrook. You love the Philadelphia Eagles. Let me get a hell yeah.